So I'd like to put up the first question for the panel. Why now? I know I'd asked Jared during our session, you know, what pains have driven, but why now? Why should banks and credit unions modernize today? And maybe James, start with you. Okay. The sky is not falling, but let's get a reality check of what's happening, right? So, um, I think it was March or April of this year, SVB collapsed in less than 48 hours with $140 billion leaving its walls with no one showing up at the door. Right. Shortly thereafter, you had a 170-year-old GSIP bank called Credit Suisse out of business because it had risk failures on multiple levels. So I think the, the rate of change that we're dealing with today is dramatic. Um, I happen to be on the New York Stock Exchange floor um, the day SVB was down 60%. And while at dinner that night with the same people from the exchange, Peter Thiel put out a text message saying that if you have your money at SVB, you should pull it out. So with one text and a lack of confidence, it all evaporated. So what are the foundational pieces that we talked about earlier? Um, we have massive rate of change, but trust. Where does trust come from in the banking world? It comes from your members and your customers. It comes from the regulators. I think that's going to be the guiding light as we think about transformation and how to take the next steps forward. Um, is, is, again, so why now? It's foundational to business viability within financial services, especially within banking, to maintain that trust. And I think data, as Jared is uh, very well uh, placed and has been discussed already, uh, is at the center of it. So how do you maintain trust between the regulators and your customers? And I think about, let's think about the landscape. It's actually, um, it's changing dramatically, right? Apple has 1.6 to 2 billion users. They're offering high yield savings accounts. We have customers and members that wish to seek yield. Bonds are giving you 5%, right? So I think this is part of the idea of then how do you understand your clients? How are you protecting the bank? So really, I'm, when I talk with customers, I'm, I'm lucky I get to talk to whether it's JP Morgan, I talk to credit unions of all size. What are people focusing on and what matters to them? What matters to them is protect and connect, right? How am I maintaining the trust around the risk that I have on my books from a credit and regulatory standpoint? Am I meeting my regulatory SLAs? Um, are my internal risk metrics accurate, right? Who do I have lending against my portfolio? What data am I taking in? How quickly can I look at that information? Um, and I think with the introduction of Gen AI, and we've done a pretty good job not saying AI, so no one has to, <laughs> from now on everyone has to drink each time we say AI. So get ready, get ready. I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> oh, sorry, second round. Right? So just to put this in a piece, that is also a fantastic opportunity, but also a tremendous risk, right? What's the one thing no one wants with anything in data? Data loss and IP exfiltration, right? So we can talk more about this in a minute, but I think, um, I think what it tells us in the banking industry is that there's opportunity, but the risk, there's consolidation risks, right? JP Morgan now owns First Republic, right? So let's think about how do we do that defensive strategy to protect, but also how do we then understand our clients better? And I really think those are the two most substantial use cases we see actually implemented across the FSI landscape within the banking industry. Risk and regulatory workloads actually being implemented and used at Snowflake, as well as customer 360, member 360 use cases, understanding the lifetime value, doing a client footprint analysis, and then trying to really get to that behavioral data that Jared was describing to really have that Netflix-like experience in an omni-channel delivery while understanding your clients to actually give them something that they want. I have four children, 22 to 15. They give away their data all the time. So it does sound creepy, but let's be very clear. People have made a decision that they're willing to use applications and they want hyper-personalized experiences. I don't love it. I'm 51 years old. My kids, they're all over it. But that's the next generation of financial services. They're much more savvy. They understand data. They understand that they're giving it away, but they want something back in return and they want a hyper-personalized experience. So. The why now, again, the sky is not falling, but I think there's tremendous risk and opportunity from which to assess and using data at the heart of it and how you scale and leverage it to meet your members' needs is gonna be crucial. Paul, would you like to go next? I'd love to, Bruce. <laughs> um, I think it's, a, it's just a 
question of inevitability. I mean, it's going to happen, right? It's, uh, you know, we work across, we work across, you know, every industry. I think we've met with some profound success in financial services, large and small. We work with individual credit unions and FIs to regional banks to large fintech players like Q2 all the way up to, you know, one of the top three global banking cores and everything kind of in between. And so it's just a, it's, it's a notion of it's happening all around you. The, the regional and community financial institutions are forced to compete with the regionals and the multinationals um, for that experience that you're talking about. And the only way you can achieve that experience is through availing yourself in the insights that, that the data hold. So it is, you know, I think the, the time is great right now because so much, and, and Snowflake has, has really been um, a lodestar in, in being able to accomplish what companies like, like ours does by building a cloud native integration with Snowflake to allow for enhanced governance or advanced data security. So we're, you know, better together is not just a cliche, but it gives you now the opportunity to leverage things that, you know, years ago or, or definitely like decades ago when I was in, in the seat in banking, we didn't have the opportunity to do. You can't just turn on a service back in 1989 to secure your data or something like that. And now you have all the tooling, you have, uh, I think, the, the subject matter expertise, and that's the other thing that I think keeps a lot of smaller FIs from moving is they maybe don't have the institutional competencies around certain domains, but you don't need those because there are people who can do that with you, whether it's you know, through folks like Passerelle or whether it's leveraging you know, some of the latest, greatest technology that allows you just to accomplish way more things at massive scale um, and really nearly at a fraction of what it used to cost. So I just think it's, it's inevitable. It's, you know, get in front of it. Um, don't be scared of it because you're not going to be in there alone. There's a lot of great things happening. And that's all I got, Bruce. Yeah, that's good, Paul. That's, you got a lot. Greg, to you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll echo both what uh, Jimmy and, and Paul mentioned about, you know, the, the, the need right now to be able to provide, you know, where the, the personalization, the, the, the know your customer, the 360, all of those things, as I mentioned, the, the war, the battlefield right now is being fought with data. And I'll go a step further and say that I, and, and argue that it's not just about today about the customer and it's not just about the growth in terms of being able to sell more product and sell more services to your existing base. I think part of the, the reason why you should be considering to do this now is as much an operational efficiency play as anything else, right? So the democratization of information access you know, within your four walls, being able to deliver better insights to help your employees do their jobs better um, in whatever capacity that you can is going to become paramount because at the end of the day, I'm not going to say that this is you know a keep up with the Joneses or you know what's good for the goose and what's is good for the gander, but your competition is, is this is where they're headed. This is what they're looking at. This is a continuous evolution, a continuous operational efficiency improvement, and being able to use data in new and innovative ways. Jared, anything to add on why now? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to connect with Greg and what James were just saying um, on the, both the operational efficiency and the risk. Um, historically, you know, we, we've used uh, Encino for our CISO analysis, if folks are familiar with Encino. And it would take three people, th three weeks of a month to get all of the data ready to upload into Encino um, to get our CISO analysis to tell us how, you know, how risky we are, how much cash we need about hand. Uh, because, again, data was all over the place and, in, in, and hard, to, hard to gather, hard to, hard to use. Um, you know, so uh, from an operational perspective, we were able to, we're almost at the point for the first time where we're able to completely automate the data. And again, three people for three weeks, that means they get one week to do their job, their real job, and then they're back at it for the next month. You know, one or two weeks, you know, and they're back at it for the next month. Um, so for the first time, we're able to, we're nearly at the point where we're gonna automate it. Um, and that was just going to help us on the risk side, uh, because now we, are, we know things so much faster, we can make reactions so much faster, um, and again, that, that nimble agility, um, that's what, you know, in such a fast-moving world now, um, it's, it's really required of, of all organizations. 